So thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, this is the second um, of the online LVS film reading sessions um, that we're hosting. Um, the sessions themselves um, are going to uh, effectively constitute an hour's worth of discussion um, around four radiographic cases that you guys have hopefully had chance to review. Um, so this is very much an interactive session. Um, this is uh, not a session where I'm going to present four cases to you. Um, I'd like you guys to tell me um, what you think um, about these cases um, and for us to uh, discuss them um, in uh, an open, um, informal, friendly environment. Um, so this is an exam um, and uh, none of these cases are in any danger. So um, quite a few of them um, were treated um, quite some time ago. So there is absolutely nothing to worry about and there is absolutely no judgment as part of these sessions. So before we start, just a little bit about me. So my name is Ian Jones and I'm a radiologist. Um, I graduated from the Royal Veterinary College in 2004 and I did my uh, certificate in diagnostic imaging in 2009. Um, I completed my uh, residency also at the Royal Veterinary College between 2013 and 2016 and I got my European Diploma in Imaging in 2018. And uh, you can find me um, at London Veterinary Specialists. So London Veterinary Specialists is a multidisciplinary referral centre um, in the heart of London. Uh, we're based um, in uh, North London in um, Belsize Park, very close to Hampstead. Um, and we have um, many different uh, referral specialists available, um, not just imaging. Um, we have uh, surgery, uh, cardiology, neurology, dermatology, cardiology. So if you guys have uh, any reason to get in touch, um, you can absolutely give us a call um, on the number listed here. Um, if you have any questions, any queries at all, if I can be of any service at all to you, as far as imaging is concerned, um, then you can uh, give me an email um, at this address. So um, without any further ado, um, we're going to start talking about these cases. And uh, when uh, preparing these cases, when I was um, attending film reading evenings just like this, um, I would try and spend about 15 minutes per case uh, preparing a radiographic description um, and coming up with um, some justifiable conclusions based on that radiographic description. And um, when I was preparing my description, I was very conscious of the sort of terminology um, that a radiologist might use. So uh, when we're presenting these cases, we really need to bear in mind the kind of runtgen signs. Um, those uh, are the things that I'd like you guys to be referring to this evening. And the recommendations at the end um, are a bit of a cherry um, on the top, really. Um, so if you think that um, you're not in a position to make a concrete diagnosis about what may or may not be going on here, and you think this patient might benefit from some additional imaging, um, then by all means suggest it. So if you think a CT would help, an ultrasound would help, um, then that's something to mention at the end. So uh, the first case uh, that you guys were given um, was a five-year-old female neutered crossbreed that presented as dyspneic. Now, this is the point um, where I essentially open up the floor and I ask one of you guys to be brave um, and to present this case. Um, so uh, there are two radiographs here. Um, there is um, a left lateral and there is a DV radiograph. And uh, I'd be interested to know what you guys thought of these radiographs. I'm happy to have a go at it unless Marta would like to. No, nah, go go for it. Go for yes, it. please. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know. It could be completely wrong. But um, so I, I felt as though, um, yeah, like you say, left lateral and DVB of the thorax. Um, I felt as though the cranial thorax was kind of cut off on the on the lateral. Um, in, in terms of changes, I thought um, there was kind of evidence on the lateral of cardiac apex elevation. Mm -hmm. um, I felt as though there was, um, it's a bit difficult to describe in Ronkin signs, I think, but um, I felt as though the, there was kind of consolidation of what I think might be like a, a right mid or long lobe, I'm not sure, um, just kind of dorsal to the heart um, and slightly cordial. Okay. Um, on the um, DV view, um, I think what I'm seeing is retraction of the lung fields. Right. Um, so I felt as though the diagnosis was pneumothorax, um, and then treatment option, trichocentesis. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's um, a very nice appraisal. Um, so uh, when we're looking at these radiographs, the first thing that strikes me is that there is um, a margin here 
in the dorsocaudal thorax that we wouldn't normally expect to see. Now, that margin represents uh, the uh, caudal lung lobes. So uh, we have a caudal lung lobe just here and a caudal lung lobe just here. And both of those lung lobes are quite significantly retracted um, from the thoracic wall. So there's quite a big gap um, between the thoracic wall and the edge of those lung lobes. And if we look at the gap, um, we can see the aorta that's just here. Um, and that aorta and the caudal lung lobes um, are surrounded by um, radiolucency effectively, so gas. Um, so that would absolutely fit um, with um, your conclusion of this patient having a pneumothorax. Um, we can also see, as you pointed out, that there is um, elevation of the cardiac silhouette um, from the sternum. Um, and um, if we look at the cranioventral thorax, uh, we can also see this uh, radiolucency, um, which again represents gas um, within the pleural space. So um, on the lateral view, whole bunch of gas, um, just ventral to the heart, and a whole bunch of gas um, in the dorsocaudal thorax. Um, there's um, some gas in the stomach as well, um, which is um, potentially a little bit confusing. Um, and there are a few other bits and pieces going on that are essentially um, incidental in this case. So th this patient, for whatever reason, has decided to eat a whole bunch of bones um, prior to popping um, this pneumothorax. If we look at the DV radiograph, um, again, we're looking for the margins of the lung lobes and we're looking for retraction of the lung lobes from the thoracic wall. And the thing that really nails it on um, as being a pneumothorax, um, we don't really need to have too much doubt about it based on the appearance on the lateral view. But in the DV view, occasionally um, it can be difficult to call a pneumothorax, particularly in very deep chested dogs where the skin folds and the skin folds can mask masquerade um, as at the edges of lung lobes. Um, it's not really an issue in this dog. It's, it's a pretty big pneumothorax and um, it's, uh, it, it, we can be pretty confident that, that there's, there's air in this pleural space. Um, we're looking for retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall, which we're seeing here. And the really important thing, if, if you're debating, is this a skin fold, is this a genuine pneumothorax, is you shouldn't really, you shouldn't be able to see any pulmonary architecture at all between the edge of the lung lobe and the thoracic wall if it's a genuine pneumothorax. If it's just an artifact like a skin fold, then you should still be able to see some of that pulmonary architecture. So you'd still be able to see um, the bronchi um, and the pulmonary vasculature, um, and potentially part of the pulmonary interstitium as well, extending right the way to the periphery of the thoracic wall. Um, so this dog absolutely has um, a bilateral, um, reasonably large volume pneumothorax. And um, I remember um, one of my supervisors saying to me that if, if you see lung lobes that are retracted from the thoracic wall to this sort of extent, then they almost look like little wings. Um, and if you see the wings, then you need to act fast and you need to uh, thracus and tease these patients pretty quickly because you don't want these wings to become the wings of the angel of death and this patient um, to uh, succumb um, to this quite a large volume pneumothorax that is popped um, on this occasion. So, yep, this dog absolutely has um, a pneumothorax. Um, so, good shout. Um, that is absolutely the diagnosis that we were looking for. Um, the uh, the radiographic, the key radiographic features here um, are elevation of the cardiac apex um, from the sternum, uh, retraction of the um, pulmonary parenchyma from the uh, thoracic wall, um, and also the fact that uh, we can't really see any pulmonary architecture at all between the thoracic wall and the edges um, of these uh, lung lobes. Um, so, yeah, good shout. That absolutely is a pneumothorax. Um, do any of you guys have any questions at all about case number one? Can I Ian, I was... Oh, go Sorry, on. go ahead. All right, so a couple of voices. Um, let's do, let's just do one at a time. No? Ian, it's, um, so I was just going to ask about the uh, triangular structure in kind of the middle of the thorax on the lateral. This, um, this structure. I, I assume it's just fat, but I just wanted your input on that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it, it probably is just fat. Um, so if we look at the radiopacity of that structure, yeah. um, it's increased relative to the gas around it, but it's not quite as radiopaque as some of the soft tissue structures. Um, I think it's it's maybe um, fat within the pleural space or the mediastinum. Um, I'm not convinced that this structure is 
any sort of uh, hernia um, or uh, represents any sort of lack of contingency or continuity of the diaphragmatic margins. Um, it does look a little bit strange, um, but I think um, that appearance is, is borne out of the fact that this patient has a bilateral quite large volume pneumothorax rather than a diaphragmatic rupture, for example. Okay, thanks. All right. Any other questions at all about case number one? Can I just ask one, please, Ian? Um, yeah. Is there any evidence of secondary consolidation? Um, so when we talk about pulmonary consolidation, we we usually talking about a lung that is filled with infiltrate. Um, so when I think about a consolidated lung, I think about a lung that has infiltrate within its interstitium and potentially within its alveoli. Um, these lungs, I think, are a bit squished um, because of the gas that's accumulated in the pleural space. So I agree that the lungs are reduced in size um, and they are increased in opacity. But I think that appearance is born of the fact that they're being compressed by the gas that's in the pleural space rather than they consolidated and filled with infiltrate. So these, these lung lobes are abnormal. Um, they're, they're too small and they're too radiopaque. But the reason why they're small and radio-opaque um, is, is not because they're filled with infiltrate, so it's not because of a pulmonary edema or because of a pneumonia. Um, it's because they're getting squished by the gas that's in the pleural space. So I wouldn't necessarily use the term consolidation here. Um, I think collapse would probably be more appropriate. Um, so uh, cons consolidated lung you're going to see in dogs with, say, aspiration pneumonia, and you're going to see a bronchograms and, and other radiographic features that are compatible with consolidation. Here, I think we've got a reduction in size and an increase in opacity. We've got a reason for that reduction in size because we've got gas in the pleural space that's potentially compressing those lungs. So I think collapse would collapse secondary to the relatively large volume bilateral pneumothorax would be a more appropriate way to describe these lungs rather than saying they're consolidated. Thank you. All right. I have a question as well for you, Ian. Yeah. Um, is there any evidence on the lateral view that is megasophagus? Because I can see one line that is not looking normal uh, to me. Yeah. So there's there's a few borders here that we wouldn't normally expect to see because yeah. of the gas that's uh, in the pleural space. So I mean, this this is the aorta here, mm -hmm. uh, and the aorta. Um, is showing up beautifully um, because it's superimposed on gas. So we can see the dorsal and the ventral walls of the aorta beautifully. And we can also see um, the dorsal and the ventral walls um, of the caudal vena cava beautifully as well. Now, that that could potentially be creating the impression that there's a megaesophagus here. Um, then we've also got this border here, which um, is the dorsal border of one of the caudal lung lobes. I'm not sure whether that's the right or the left. Tricky to say, um, but it's definitely a lung lobe um, rather than the dorsal or the ventral border of the esophagus. So there's there's a whole bunch of, of margins of borders here that we wouldn't normally expect to see because of the gas um, that's in the pleural space. Um, so we've got um, more... We've got lots of instances where there's more dense soft tissue material superimposed or next to adjacent to um, gas, which, which isn't very dense at all, which is which is making these margins, these borders very pronounced. And I think that that's probably what's contributing to the, the impression that you have. Maybe there's a megrosophagus here. I, I don't think there's a megrosophagus here. I think there's um, just a bilateral pneumothorax and there's a whole bunch of margins that we're seeing because of the gas that's in the pleural space. And that's maybe creating the impression that we can see the dorsal and the ventral borders of the esophagus creating the impression of the megrosophagus, but it's it's just that there's a bunch of gas in that pleural space and there's a whole bunch of borders of margins here that we wouldn't normally expect to see that um, are much more visible. Um, what about slightly caudally when you're like kind of meeting the stomach? There is like a line caudal dorsally, a little yeah. bit more dorsal, uh, going into yeah. your left, I would say. So, so right around here? No, a little bit more in the abdomen. So right around that, here? That line, yeah. Yeah, that, okay. yeah so, I mean, this, no, this it margin seems like here, a yeah. structure. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly, I mean, there is a margin there. I mean, I think that's... Again, it, that, that could be one of the diaphragmatic crew that's looking a little bit abnormal. Um, there's some gas in the stomach here as well that's superimposed that might be contributing to this margin. Um, I don't honestly know exactly what that is, but if 
for me to start thinking about mega esophagus, I'd need to be confident that I could see both the dorsal and the ventral walls of the esophagus, and then it, it would be in, in this sort of region here. Okay. Thank and, you. and I'm not entirely sure what this margin is. I, I think it's, it's a combination of the gas that's in the pleural space and the gas that's in the stomach. And, and there's going to be the diaphragmatic crura here as well um, that are going to be contributing to some of the margins that we can see in this region. But I'm not convinced there's a microsophagus here. Okay. I have a lovely imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Great. Everybody happy with case number one? Just a quick question. Yeah. Um, would you say that there is like a very mild amount of pneumomediastinum as well, like surrounding the, the trachea? So you're talking about these, yes. this, this little radiolucent area here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't say for sure that there's not a pneumomediastinum here. So, I mean, normally um, if there's a pneumomediastinum, then I'd expect to see the brachycephalic trunk and the right subclavian a little bit. Uh, clearer than I am here, but you're absolutely right. There is there is a tiny bit of radiolucency that is just ventral to the ventral wall of the trachea, um, and that that could absolutely represent a small volume pneumomediastinum. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a reasonable point. Okay, thanks. All right. In, any other questions? No? Okay, let's move on to case number two, which is a three-year-old female neutered Great Dane um, that's presented to you guys with abdominal pain. Um, so, who is feeling brave? There's only a single radiograph um, for this one, so just a single right lateral radiograph. Um, so, anybody feeling brave and would like to uh, just share their thoughts on what they think is going on here? So, <clears throat> we got, so, how about, uh, we've got Rebecca that's just joined us. Um, Rebecca, can you hear me? If not Rebecca, then how about Victoria? We've got Victoria as well. Oh, gosh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, so we've got a right lateral abdominal radiograph. Yeah. Um, can't quite see the the cranial and caudal borders, but we've got most of it on there. Yeah, this is a big, um, big beast. This is a big old. Yeah. <laughs> um, it looks like you've got reasonable cirrhosal detail cordally. You can see small intestinal loops. Uh, they look quite uniform. Yeah. Um, and you can see some of the uh, rugal folds of the stomach. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, dorsal left-hand corner. Um, but then there's a big soft tissue opacity in the mid-abdomen that's yeah. obscuring the borders of uh, kind of the caudal borders of the liver and the spleen. Yeah. Um, I don't know, is that... I. I Actually, no, I was going to say is that some free gas in the uh, just um, ventral to the spine, but actually I think that's just within some intestinal um, loops there probably. Yeah. And then I can't quite tell if that's a bladder or a kidney. Um, yeah, this, this there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yes, and then I can't really identify any of the other abdominal organs we've just got this big soft tissue opacity yeah absolutely no I, I, I completely agree with all of those findings um, so having described the changes beautifully what do you think might be going on uh, I, so I think either an abdominal mass yep or an accumulation of fluid okay yeah, I mean that's 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 certainly a possibility. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd probably go for a mass, as I suppose fluid would tend to obscure most of the abdominal organs. Yeah, absolutely. So I think if if there was a whole bunch of uh, um, peritoneal effusion here, then we'd um, see uh, quite a diffuse loss of peritoneal serosal detail. 
Um, and, and I agree that, that we've got this uniform soft tissue opacity right in the middle of the abdomen. Um, and that, I think you're right, I think that fits more with a soft tissue mass rather than um, just a large volume effusion. Um, I, I absolutely agree that we can see some loops of, of small bowel here. Um, and I think you're right in your assessment that the gas leucistes that we can see in this um, dorsocaudal abdomen are most likely within loops of small bowel rather than being free gas. Um, so yeah, we, we've got this this kind of big soft tissue structure right in the middle here. Um, and then also this, this structure here, which may or may not be part of this larger structure we can see in the middle of the abdomen um, to try and ponder over and to try and work out what that might be. So uh, I suppose what we're looking at here is, is potentially a, a soft tissue mass within the mid-abdomen. Um, so having got as far as that, we need to think about, okay, if this is a mid-abdominal soft tissue mass, what, what might our differentials be here? And I can open that up to the floor. doesn't necessarily have to be Victoria who carries on. So anybody like to hazard a guess? We'll come up with some differentials as, as to what, what this might be. So where we've got to with this case um, is uh, I, I do think there is a little bit of a loss of peritoneal cirrhosis detail, detail here. I, I agree that um, we still we can still see the small bowel, um, but it, it's really tricky to see the margins um, of the liver. Um, it's really tricky to see the spleen. Um, uh, it's difficult to know whether we've included enough of this abdomen to see the bladder, um, but everything looks a little bit effaced. Um, there aren't really any beautifully clear margins anywhere, so I think there probably is a little bit of effusion here. <coughs> we have got this uniform soft tissue opacity um, in the center of the abdomen, um, <coughs> and we've got associated um, ventral displacement um, of the small bowel. Uh, the, the, sh the shape of the stomach as well is, is quite abnormal, so um, the, the greater curvature of the stomach looks like it's just displaced a little bit um, cranially, uh, so we've got associated displacement um, of the stomach and the small bowel with whatever this thing is, um, and uh, we've got, uh, what else have we got? We've got a little bit of maybe ventral displacement of, of the colon, but there really isn't very much material in the colon, and um, it's tricky to know whether this is colon or small bowel. So the main event here is this uniform soft tissue opacity in the middle of the abdomen. Um, so yeah, we need to come up with some differentials, and we're suspicious as well that there might be some peritoneal effusion. Here. Not, a, not a huge volume, but, but maybe um, a small volume peritoneal effusion and maybe some peritonitis as well. So um, anybody like to hazard a guess as to what might be going on here, what, what we're looking at here. This is a, this is a three-year-old Great Dane. And uh, <clears throat> my thoughts initially were splenic mass. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I, think, uh, I think a splenic origin like is- a ruptured is, splenic mass, essentially. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's um, absolutely on the differential list here. So, I mean, Anything kind of in the, in the mid abdomen here, um, spleen has to be in the French list. But we're not we're not really seeing spleen um, in the ventral abdomen, um, and uh, that could be because of the effusion that we're a little bit suspicious of. But it could be that the, the spleen just just isn't there, um, and that the, this thing in the centre um, actually represents the spleen. Um, so uh, a splenic mass uh, that's ruptured is yep yeah, totally on the differential list here. And if, if it were a splenic, splenic mass that's ruptured, then you know, something sinister like an amangiosarcoma um, would would certainly be uh, something we should be considering. Um, it's quite a young dog though, so you know it's only it's only three years old. I mean this, this dog would be pretty unfortunate to get a amangiosarcoma at three. It's not not beyond the realms of possibility, um, but it would it'd be, be unfortunate. Um, so any anything else that this might be? Liver mass. Uh, liver. Hmm. So, in terms of the the origin of this mass, um, it's difficult for us to to, to see the liver here. Um, we we can just maybe make out the caudal margins um, of the liver, uh, just at the in the, the craniovental part of this radiograph. Um, the reason why I think liver is less likely is because if this was a liver mass, then we maybe expect to see some sort of um, sh shift in the gastric axis. And, and usually, if you have liver masses, um, then the gastric axis 
um, tends to shift um, caudally and dorsally. So the stomach gets sort of pushed away from the liver and the liver mass and shifts caudally and dorsally. And if anything, this the stomach is is pushed cranially. Um, and it, it, we have seen um, some some cases recently LVS of patients that have uh, really big pedunculated liver masses um, that end up in the middle of the abdomen. But that's that's not typical. Um, so the fact that the the stomach is displaced cranially makes me think that a liver mass is probably less likely. It's it's on the differential list, but it's certainly further down the list than spleen. Um, and again, because this dog is three years old, it would it would have to be a giant pedunculated hepatic mass um, to be creating this sort of radiographic appearance, which again is 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 not impossible, um, but it's it's maybe less likely. So um, I'm liking the thought that this is is going to be related to the spleen. Um, is is there anything yeah. else? Yeah, go on. I was going to say, could you have a splenic torsion? Absolutely. Um, so splenic torsion is is definitely on the differential list for this dog. So we've got this mid abdominal mass. Um, it's yeah. it's uniform. It's soft tissue. This is a young dog. It's a big dog as well. So um, the type of dog that, that that might get a splenic torsion. Um, and we don't really see the spleen in the uh, ventral abdomen. Um, so that, that could be because there's a little bit of fusion here, or it could be that the spleen is actually in an abnormal location. So rather than in the ventral abdomen, it's, it's just shifted a little bit dorsally and it's in the mid abdomen. Um, and that's exactly what this dog had. So this is um, a young Great Dane with a splenic torsion. So all, all of this structure here um, and this little knobbly bit at the end, um, that's that's all spleen. Um, so the spleen is, is twisted, it's shifted in position, and it's increased in size. Um, so it, it's ended up um, being large with these um, sort of poorly marginated, um, sort of smooth margins. Um, and the the actual diagnosis here we got based on ultrasound. So you couldn't say definitively that this is a splenic torsion based on these radiographs, just that there is a large mid-abdominal mass that is most likely splenic in origin. The fact that this dog is quite so young means that um, you should probably consider other differentials other than the sinister ones like hemangiosarcoma and associated rupture and hemoabdomen. So splenic torsion should should cross your mind here. Well, why why is this three year old dog got a giant splenic mass? And the answer is, well, it's not a splenic mass. It's actually a splenic torsion. And the way to nail this on as a splenic torsion uh, would be to pop an ultrasound probe on this patient. And patients with splenic torsion have a very distinctive um, appearance of their spleen. So, so their spleen looks um, very hypoechoic with loads of hyperechoic structures in it. And it's sometimes described as like a, like a starry sky. Um, so that's what happened in this patient. Um, so we thought this dog looks like it's got a giant splenic mass. Um, it's very young though, so that's a little bit unusual. Let's just pop the probe on and see how the spleen looks. Spleen was very, very hypoechoic with lots of hyperechoic foci throughout the splenic parenchyma, which is pretty much pathognomonic um, for splenic torsion. Um, and that's what this beast had. So this dog had a splenic torsion. So good shout. Um, nice job. So um, anybody got any questions about case number two before we move on to the next one? Everybody happy with case number two? Splenic torsion? Okay. So case number three is an eight-year-old female neutered miniature schnauzer um, that's presented to you guys with um, nasal discharge. Um, so you have two radiographs. Um, so you have um, an open mouth uh, VD and you've got a lateral radiograph. So who is feeling in the mood for interpreting some nasal radiographs? Anybody fancy taking on case number three? Now, what else have we got here? So for no other reason other than uh, Olga is on my screen. Olga, um, do you fancy taking this one on? Uh, yes, okay. Okay, great. Let's try. So, uh, I see um, a multifocal increase in, uh, in soft tissue opacity. Okay. In uh, both nasal cavities. Okay. Maybe more in the left one. I don't know if the left one is the one that th there's a tooth missing. 
So you think of this is no tooth here. Yeah. So there's no there's no left right marker on this. So it's uh, it's it's essentially impossible to know which is left and which is right. But okay, we'll we'll, we'll call this one the left. Okay. So this is left. <laughs> so there is an increasing opacity in the middle uh, middle part of the left nasal cavity, and then there is uh, hyperlucency in the right one. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Basically, and also in the right one, in the caudal part, there is a mainly mild increase in opacity as well. So we're going around here. Not to see the, the, the turbinates well. Yep. And and that's it. Okay. So the lateral one, uh, not the most useful view uh, for this sort of case, um, but yeah. Um, Okay, so we've got multiple changes here, so we're missing a tooth, but we're not, we're not going to worry too much about that. Um, and there are some changes to these nasal cavities. Um, so um, based on the changes you've picked up, what, what do you think might be going on here? So I don't see bony bone lysis. To me, the, the vomer looks fine. Yeah, I agree. So, um, so, see. so my main differentials with these changes would be first nasal tumor, okay. uh, like considering the the age of the animal. Yeah, and so this is eight years old, this dog. The the other differential for me could be aspergillosis. Yep. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. No, I think that's that's fair. So. Um, there's some evidence here of uh, ag aggressive disease, essentially. So um, you've um, picked up the fact that we've we've got loss of turbinates um, on on the right here. So if we compare the right and the left nasal cavities, and we look more at the rostral nasal cavity, we can see that there are very fine uh, radiolucencies that represent the the nasal turbinates. Um, so there's little arborizing gas lucencies here on the left that represent gas uh, between the nasal turbinates. So we've got some nasal turbinates um, on the left here, which is fine. But then if we compare that um, to the right, um, it's almost kind of a uniform radiolucency. So uh, there's, there's really not very many nasal turbinates um, on the right here at all. Um, and whenever we start seeing loss of nasal turbinates, we need to start thinking about um, aggressive disease. And um, the two sorts of aggressive disease that you've uh, mentioned would be fungal disease, like aspergillosis, <coughs> or potentially um, something sinister, um, a neoplastic, like uh, a carcinoma, for example. Now, what allows us to differentiate between the two is that if you have uh, a nasal tumor, um, normally you will see an increase in soft tissue opacity combined with a loss of nasal turbinates and potentially other bony destruction. And um, you uh, talked about the fact that the intranasal septum or the vomer bone is, is intact. Um, the, the cribriform plate looks okay as well. Um, and I'm not really seeing uh, any evidence of any cortical destruction or periosteal reaction or anything else um, in uh, any of these radiographs that might suggest that there's a huge amount of bony destruction, just a whole bunch of turbinate destruction. Now, if, if this was something like a nasal carcinoma, then as well as seeing this turbinate destruction, we'd really expect to see um, quite a, a marked increase in soft tissue opacity. Um, so the way that we can try and differentiate between um, f a, a aggressive disease like um, aspergillosis and fungal disease and um, disease like uh, a malignancy, like a nasal carcinoma, um, is with a carcinoma, you're gonna see uh, loss of nasal turbinates and potentially some other changes like um, destruction, <coughs> di di like di destruction of the intranasal septum and destruction of the cribriform plate and some other bony changes. But with things like um, aspergillosis and fungal disease, you're just gonna see destruction of the turbinates. And I think that's that, That's what we're seeing here. We're seeing a, a, a lack of, of turbinates um, on this right side. Um, and I think that fits uh, much more with um, fungal disease um, like aspergillosis um, rather than um, malignancy um, like nasal carcinoma. Um, so this, this little area here, I, I kind of agree that it, it looks a little bit increased in opacity, but I think I can still see some turbinates um, just 
uh, superimposed over that, that area. So I'm, I'm not convinced that this area represents a mass. There just really aren't any turbinates at all on this side. Um, and I think that, that fits much more with um, a fungal disease like aspergillosis um, rather than um, something sinister like a nasal carcinoma. Um, now, the other thing that we could potentially have done here to, to try and help is this to take um, a closer look um, at the uh, frontal sinuses. Um, so we could have done um, a rostral caudal view um, of the frontal sinuses um, and uh, with, uh, well, both with malignancies like nasal carcinomas um, and aspergillosis, you can see changes to the frontal sinuses. So with aspergillosis, we might expect to see some thickening um, of the frontal bone um, of the affected sinus. So on that right side, some thickening of the frontal bone. We've only got two views here, um, but I think, I think there's enough here particularly um, in this um, in this view, this open mouth view, to say that there really aren't any turbinates at all on this right side. And that loss of turbinate doesn't really seem to have been replaced with um, soft tissue opacity. So because I'm not really seeing a discrete mass here, um, something like fungal disease, like as aspergillosis, is maybe a little bit more likely. Um, and, I, and that's what this dog um, was, was presumptively diagnosed with. So we were more suspicious here of fungal disease like aspergillosis um, than something like a nasal carcinoma. So yeah, nice job. Anybody have any questions or comments about case number three? Everybody happy? Okay. So that brings us on to case number four, um, which is a six-year-old uh, female entire mastiff um, that's presented to you guys as dyspneic. Uh, there is a right lateral, um, there is a DV, and there is a left lateral thoracic view of this beast. Um, so, uh, who is uh, feeling like they'd like to take on case number four? <clears throat> well, so we are here. So I'm going to pick somebody essentially at random, and it's going to be Jude. Jude, do you fancy taking on case number four? Jude is going to remain mute. Okay. So next to Jude, we've got Katie. Does Katie fancy taking on case number four? It isn't compulsory, but the more that you get involved, the more you're likely to get out of it. Uh, what else have we got? I don't mind doing it, Annie. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, go for it. Okay. So in we have, as you said, the right, the left laterals on the DV. So the first one, uh, the right lateral, I kind of... I try to feel that the... Cardiac silhouette is kind of a masquerade, a soft tissue opacity mass that is kind of hiding the heart. Okay. Um, there is also a slightly elevation of the trachea dorsally. Yep. Um, so that makes me think that something is pushing the trachea uh, dorsally, which will be compatible with, with the mass. Um, on the, I would say there is kind of like interstitial pattern on the dorsal uh, aspect of the lung. Okay, kind of around here. Yeah, um, and then if we move to the DV, I found it <laughs> really difficult to know what is heart and what is mass. Yeah, that is, uh, that's tricky in this one. Yeah, it's like a double heart dog lesions that Mike has described, and, and she's absolutely right. Um, in this right lateral view, um, there is an increase in soft tissue opacity in the craniventral thorax, and that's leading to effacement of the borders of the cardiac silhouette. And you definitely get the impression that there is some dorsal displacement of the trachea. Um, in this left lateral view, um, you get the you maybe get the impression that there are actually discrete mass lesions here. So we're starting to see uh, the borders um, of these lesions. and they are located um, just cranial um, to the cardiac silhouette um, in the craniventral thorax. And there's also just a suggestion that there's a lesion just here um, at the hilus 
um, potentially at the heart base. Uh, this this thing here we were talking about, I think it's probably just part of the stomach wall. So this is this is the gastric wall here, um, and this this structure here I think is is just part of the gastric wall that's just superimposed um, on that called lung lobe. So I'm not convinced that this is a nodule here. Um, I think this is real. This is a real increase in soft tissue capacity. This is real here. Um, that's that's also a structure that shouldn't be there, and this is real. Um, and this mediastinum is is absolutely way bigger than it should be. So that's a giant mediastinum. Um, and I agree that this, this is probably the heart, and it's displaced um, to the right. And, and this this is a giant soft tissue opacity here um, that that shouldn't really be there. That is more than likely mediastinal. Um, so um, if we're looking at a mediastinal mass um, rather than a pulmonary mass, um, then or, or pulmonary metastasis, for example, then that's really going to affect um, our differentials. Um, so if if this indeed is a mediastinal rather than a pulmonary mass, then what sort of differentials do we think we need to be considering in this six-year-old mastiff? And again, I'm opening opening up that to the floor. So anybody that feels like they uh, would like to suggest some differentials for this dog that has a has a big big old mediastinal mass, um, yeah. What you put? Lymphoma big Hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, these could absolutely be big lymph nodes. So um, in the left lateral view, uh, we've we've got just the impression that, that this this giant mass that we can see in the DV could be made up of lots of smaller masses. Um, and we know that there are lymph nodes that live in the mediastinum. So there's um, the sternal lymph nodes that live in this sort of location, just above the second and the third sternobra, and there's also some cranial mediastinal lymph nodes as well. So these these could easily be big cranial mediastinal lymph nodes, and and just this structure here, which is quite poorly marginated and tricky to see, um, that that could be a tricky bronchial lymph node, um, or even another big cranial mediastinal lymph node. Um, so uh, these could absolutely be big lymph nodes, um, and if they are big lymph nodes, um, then um, potentially this dog could have uh, a lymphoma, for example. Um, any any other differentials that you guys might consider in a dog that has a, a big mediastinal mass? You can think about the thymoma. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So, so thymoma would be um, the other big one. Um, so thymomas can be absolutely huge. Um, and so uh, this dog has a big mediastinal mass. Um, so thymoma definitely um, on the differential list. Um, so lymphoma um, and thymoma, um, absolutely. Uh, for anything else that we might think about? Microsarcoma. Carcinoma. Uh, yeah, so I mean, occasionally like thyroid carcinomas. Um, so you can sometimes get um, the, um, malignancy associated with ectopic thyroid tissue. So like thyroid carcinoma is an example. Um, Evangiosarcoma. I mean, the evangiosarcs can pop up in in really weird places. Uh, it wouldn't be typical, so it'd be further down the list relative to uh, thymoma, lymphoma. Um, and carcinoma, but it's it's certainly a possibility. Um, we've had a couple of dogs recently that have had giant um, histiocytic sarcomas. I mean, they, they can pop up all over the place. Uh, I think it's 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 further down the list relative to lymphoma and thymoma, um, but that that would also be a possibility. Um, so yeah, uh, this dog uh, actually had uh, lymphoma. So all of these structures that that you guys can see and that you've very nicely described um, are all giant lymph nodes. Um, and in the, in the DV view, they've all sort of squished up together to create this just giant mediastinal mass that's pushing that cardiac silhouette over to the right. Um, so uh, the key thing here is um, being able to differentiate between a mediastinal mass um, and a pulmonary mass. And um, if you picked up the fact that this mediastinum looks giant um, in the DV view, then you can be a little bit more confident uh, about uh, interpreting these um, structures, these um, poorly marginated increases in soft tissue opacity as being mediastinal structures um, rather than pulmonary structures. Um, and immediately uh, you identify them as mediastinal structures rather than pulmonary, then that changes your differential slightly. You're thinking more about lymphomas, thymomas, rather than things like pulmonary metastasis um, or potentially um, pulmonary tumors um, like um, bronchialveolar carcinomas. Uh, so yeah, nice job. So uh, the answer here is is lymphoma. This uh, this poor mastiff had a lymphoma. Um, so uh, any of you guys have any questions um, about case number four? Everybody happy? <coughs> Everybody happy that uh, were they to see a radiograph such as this next week in practice that they pick it up as a mediastinal mass and come up with those differentials? Okay. <coughs> 
so we've got a little bit of a little bit of time left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys uh, a um, a bonus case. So this is this is our bonus round. Um, so uh, essentially, I just want you guys to let me know what you think is going on here. Um, so hopefully, you've had a chance to review the radiographs. Um, yeah, what what is going on in this radiograph? And again, I'm looking for volunteers to express their opinions. I don't want to necessarily tell you guys what is going on for these cases. Anybody like to volunteer what's going on here? Am I allowed or should I leave it to the floor? <laughs> I'd leave it. I'd leave You're it not well. allowed. <laughs> Fine. So I know, I know that Luke knows the answer, essentially. But I'd like uh, the rest of you guys that are attending to uh, throw in your two penneth. What is going on here? Any takers? Who have we got? So we've got Petros has been with us since right at the start. Petros? Are you uh, willing to add your two penneth? All right. Uh, we've also got uh, Tatiana. Um, something funky happened with the X-ray plate. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, so what what makes you say that? Um. Because there's sort of a, a black line where nothing physical should be kind of stopping the X-rays. Um, well, this this kind of line here. Yeah, I can't, I can't see the marker. Um, oh, um, sort of on the right side, just going down the body wall. Oh, here we go. Like this it's this this that, thing here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that looks that, that, like a technological is... malfunction rather than a biological malfunction yeah no absolutely so i mean this this radiograph looks looks very abnormal and uh, i think you're absolutely right i think chances are this is something artifactual um, rather than something pathological um so we're looking for essentially what what's the artifact here um and there's there's a few other things on this radiograph that that might clue you in as to as to what's happened so this this is kind of weird this mm -hmm. this margin here. Any other features that you think look very very abnormal? And this is this isn't just for Tatiana. This is this is this is an this is an open floor. The position I can't quite figure out whether it's a natural or something else. Yeah, no, I agree. It's 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 really weird to know kind of how this dog has been positioned because the, the ribs just look really bizarre. So I mean, you, you've got some ribs that that look like the sort of angled cranially as they should be and then, then other ribs that, that look like they're kind of angled sort of cordially and and that that doesn't that doesn't really fit with with normal anatomy so i, I agree there's there's definitely something something really strange about the, the dog's position or uh just the anatomy here there's there, there are there are structures here that they really shouldn't be there anything else you can twice yeah, I, I think that's a really good shout. So, so what makes you say that? I think I can see femur up there. Yeah, absolutely. So what what on earth are these structures here? They are legs. They absolutely are legs. Um, so <clears throat> we've got a thorax here, and we've got diaphragm, and we've got a cardiac silhouette. But then we've got what looked like femurs. So we've got a femur here and a femur here. And we've got part of a pelvis here as well. And we've got part of a tail just at the level of the thoracic inlet. So, I mean, that that, that can't be right. And so there's definitely something strange that's gone on here. Now, it's tricky to see because those structures are superimposed over the scapulae. So there's there's the right scapula here and the left scapula here. Um, but that that's definitely a femur and that's definitely a femur and that's that's probably part of a tail and then if you look a little bit more closely you're like well actually this this looks like a pelvis here um and that's that's probably the ilium which means that some of these ribs that that i can see here probably don't belong to the same dog 
whose thorax this is. And, and there's actually kind of a bit of a spine here as well, which which really shouldn't be there. So we've got a bit of a spine here and a bit of a spine here. So, I mean, this is this is effectively a double exposure. So this is um, a radiograph of, of two dogs. So it's, it's a lateral abdominal radiograph and um, a dorsoventral thoracic radiograph taken using the same cassette. So this is, this is a double exposure. Um, so it's a really nice um, example of that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just something to watch out for. So it, it's, it's the thing that gives it, the thing that I noticed initially on this radiograph was, as you say, you've, you've got two, two bones here that shouldn't be there and then they, they look like femurs. And then if you follow them, you can see that, that actually there's a pelvis and a tail um, and then a spine as well that really shouldn't be there. So this is an example of an artifact. Um, it's a double exposure artifact. Um, so hopefully, um, if you guys have seen this before, um, you recognize it, um, you've seen one now. Um, so if you come across one in future, um, you're going to pick it up very quickly and know exactly what it is. So yeah, um, nice work. So that was our bonus round, which was um, an artifact um, rather than um, anything clinical, any sort of clinical pathology. So yeah, nice job. Um, so we got it. So this is a double exposure. <coughs> so anybody have any questions at all about any of the cases that we've been through this evening? So if we run through them very quickly, <coughs> we have, we've got our pneumothorax. Uh, we have our splenic torsion. Uh, we have uh, suspected aspergillosis, and we have our lymphoma. Um, any of you guys have any questions at all about any of these cases um, before we finish the session for the evening? Okay, with the aspergillosis one, was yeah. there something abnormal with the third incisor on the normal side? It's got a bit of like... Oh, here. Um, no, on the other side. Oh, here. Like yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So there's absolutely. So there's definitely some periodontal disease here. So there's uh, a radiolucent halo um, surrounding um, this incisor. Um, so uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think there's there's absolutely some evidence of periodontal disease affecting that tooth. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions about any of these cases? Okay. All right, great. Well, uh, thank all of you guys um, for joining us uh, this evening. Um, we really would like to uh, know uh, how you found it so uh, we can um, improve things. Um, if you have um, any questions um, or any comments or any queries at all um, about the evening, then um, please, please feel free to get in touch with me um, at that um, email address. Um, we hope to uh, host these sessions um, once a month, and we're planning on um, hosting them the last Wednesday of every month. Um, we will advertise the next one uh, before beforehand. Um, so just like this evening, um, if you'd like to attend, um, then let us know and we can uh, add you to uh, our list, make sure that you can attend. Um, and yeah, I hope uh, you found it uh, enjoyable. Um, so the format for the next time will be exactly the same as this evening. So I will get four cases out to you guys at least a week in advance. Um, that gives you a little bit of time to have a look at them. Um, and then during the hour session, um, we can all get together and have a chat about the radiographs and, and discuss the findings and the conclusions. Um, so yeah, thank ev well, thank you all for attending. Um, and I hope uh, you've enjoyed it. Um, and uh, yeah thank you ian these You're sessions right. were always super useful so it's uh, it's great being part of it thanks very much great. no worries no worries all right so that's uh, that's it for now um so uh, yeah um get in touch if i can be of any further assistance to you guys a little bit of feedback would be good on the email as well and uh, yeah i hope uh, you have a very lovely evening and thank you very much indeed for all attending thank you oh. very much thank you, ian. Thank you very much